He's contributed essays to 15 books and is featured in White Men Challenging Racism, 35 Personal Stories. Wise will have two books out in 2006, Disasters Natural and Otherwise, Race, Class, and the Destruction of New Orleans, and a collection of essays, Speaking Treason Fluently, Dissident Reflections on Race, Faith, and Nation. Tim will have a limited number of copies of White Like Me available after the, the meeting this evening. Tim has a BA in political science from Tulane University where his anti-apartheid work received global attention and the thanks of Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He received training in methods for dismantling racism from the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond in New Orleans. He and his wife Christy are the proud parents of two daughters. Please join me in welcoming Tim Wise. Thank you. Um, well, we don't have a whole lot of time this evening, so I'm going to dispense with all the nice, pretty formalities of thanking all the people who made it possible for me to be here, though I guess I've just done that indirectly, so thanks. Um, and jump right into the substance of the remarks that I wish to make this evening before we have a little dialogue afterward. I always like to tell my audiences that I think it's a, a very good idea when somebody stands in front of you and is proclaimed to you to be an expert on something, whether it is a speaker coming in from the outside or a professor in the classrooms of the classes that you attend. It's always a good thing to ask, why am I listening to this person? Why is this the person whose knowledge is deemed so valuable that I'm going to spend precious time in my day, or if it's a professor in an entire semester or whatnot, listening to them as opposed to any of the other people out there who are every bit as knowledgeable, maybe more so, who could be giving the speech, who could be teaching the class, who could be dispensing the wisdom, but who aren't, because you're listening to that one person, in this case, tonight, me. Now, my mother would love for you to believe that the reason you're listening to me tonight and not somebody else not one of those many millions of people who know every bit as much about racism as me, and especially folks of color who know quite a bit more. She would love for you to believe that the reason it's me and not them is because I'm just the brightest bulb in the box. Because that's what moms like to think about their children, because then it reflects well on them, because then they get to take some credit for them being so bright, you see. And the culture in which we live would probably also encourage us to believe and would love for me to believe that the reason it's me speaking here tonight and 85 other times in the course of a calendar year at campuses and in communities around the country is because I'm just the best speaker on this issue to be found. I'm just that good. I'm just that insightful. And while I am a good speaker, and I intend to demonstrate that in the next 45 minutes, and while I'm a pretty decent writer, and I intend to demonstrate that as well if you were so kind as to buy one of the 19 or 20 copies of the book that I brought with me this evening. The fact remains that that is not why I'm here, and it is not why I get 85 to 90 engagements a year. It's not because I'm the best, per se, or the brightest when it comes to dispensing wisdom on the issue of race. It is really for one reason and one reason only, and that is because I'm white. That's why it's me. That's why I'm here. In fact, that's why my entire professional career has taken the trajectory it has taken. I tell you this not to take away from whatever real honest talents I might have, which I think are genuine in many areas, but because those talents alone could not have brought me or anyone else in this society to the positions that they now hold, absent a structure of opportunity that has given some of us and most definitely not all of us, an extra head start. How do I know this to be true? How do I know this to be more than mere speculation? It's very simple. You see, I've been doing anti-racism work professionally now for 16 years, ever since I got out of college. I've been on the lecture circuit for 12 of those. I will be 38 next week. How does someone who is only in their early 20s gain a reputation as a national anti-racist sufficient to get them out on the lecture circuit to talk about these issues beginning at the age of 26 years old? How does someone right out of college get work doing anti-racism activism that will propel them to that level of national prominence? Again, 
My mother would love for you to think it's just because I'm just that damn good, but that would be a lie. The reality is it is because I'm white. How do I know? It's very simple. The very first job I had, you see, I got out of college doing anti-racism work. I lived in New Orleans and happened to graduate from Tulane University in 1990, the year that David Duke, former leader of the largest Ku Klux Klan group in the United States, lifelong white supremacist, and I would call him a neo-Nazi, but that would give him credit for having thought of something new, since neo implies new, and he's sort of old school Nazi, sort of paleolithic or Jurassic Nazi, or whatever that makes you. And he was running for the United States Senate that year, having already been elected to the Louisiana State Legislature the year before, and I was given the job as the associate director of the organization formed to prevent him from winning that election. And then the next year, the election for governor, which he then ran in after he lost the Senate race. Um, and that was pretty important work in terms of national publicity. It was a big story, national, international news. So being in the midst of that, as I was, allowed me and my opinions, my views, my voice, right, to be heard, to be amplified in a way that it wouldn't have been had I not had that job, which then begs the question, how'd I get that job? Because that's pretty sweet work to get right out of school, you know? A job that allows people all over the world to hear what you have to say about an important issue like that election or like racism in general. Well, I got the job the old fashioned way, which is to say that I knew the two guys who started the organization and they offered it to me. Right? One was a history professor of mine, the other was a grad student and an activist friend of mine at Tulane at the time, and they offered me the job. And I took it after initially turning it down, later went back and took it and worked my way up to the associate director position and gained all this prominence, which then begs the question, how did I know these men? Because if I don't know them, I don't get that job, I don't get to fight David Duke, I don't build up a national reputation as an anti-racist, and I'm not on the lecture circuit, and you're listening to somebody else here this evening, which by the time I'm done, you may very well wish is exactly what had happened, but too bad for you, because it's me. Well, I only knew these men because I'd gone to Tulane. If I'd gone to any other college on the planet, I wouldn't have met them, I wouldn't have known them, I wouldn't have been in that position. Then that begs the question, how'd I get to Tulane? Because Tulane was then and is now an extremely expensive institution of higher learning, and my family was then and is now exceptionally broke. And how do broke people get to go to such expensive schools? My family had never owned a piece of property, we rented my entire life, drove cars until they stopped running, had no savings, didn't take vacations, lived paycheck to paycheck, and this campus was going to cost me to go to it, at that time, 1986 dollars, keep in mind, 17,000 dollars for tuition and fees, it's now well over 40, but 17 was still an awful lot in 1986, and my family certainly didn't have anywhere near that amount of money. Now I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, well fool, you do the same thing that we all did. You go into debt for the next 20 years by taking out student loans that you won't be able to pay off until you're married and have children. Well, that's a good piece of advice. But, and I will now speak of myself in the third person because it's less embarrassing this way, Tim Wise has a problem. Tim Wise's problem is procrastination. Maybe you share this problem with me. In any event, my procrastination problem, which the people here will more than attest to, because I didn't get my contract back to them until like three days ago, and we've been working on this for months. So it isn't a problem that I've conquered. But back in the day, my procrastination problem caused me to get my financial aid forms in four months too late. That's even worse than getting the contract back in two months late. Because I know if I get the contract in, I'm gonna get paid. But if I don't get the financial aid forms in on time, there's a real good chance I'm not gonna get any money for a school that's gonna cost 17,000. Well, they'd already let me in and they'd made a promise to try to meet my needs. So even though I screwed up, they sent me a letter and it said, Tim, we're looking forward to having you in late August, but the problem is we've only got $7,000 left in financial aid to offer you and it's gonna cost 17, as you well know. Hope you can come up with the other 10 in effect and good luck, we'll see you in about a month and a half. So there was a $10,000 gap between what they were offering and what it was going to cost. How do we fill that gap when we have no money and no property? Well, easy. My mom goes down to the bank and gets a loan for $10,000. But that's one hell of a trick because banks are not in the habit of giving broke people $10,000. There's just nothing in it for them. It's not logical. It's not rational. There's no financial sense. 
but they did it, keeping in mind, if they don't do it, I don't go to Tulane, don't meet those men, don't get that job, don't fight David Duke, don't build up a national reputation as an anti-racist, and do not end up where I am today professionally, irrespective of whatever genius I might actually possess. So how'd my mom get the 10 grand? Simple. Her mom, my grandmother, went down to the bank with her, co-signed the loan using her house as collateral so that if my mother defaulted on the loan, a distinct possibility given her credit record at the time, they would be able to take my grandmother's house and everything would be fine. They couldn't lose. Either we paid the loan back with interest or they got a nice house in a quote unquote nice neighborhood where the property values were always increasing because the demand was high in this particular part of town. And in case you haven't guessed, it was the fourth house that she had owned with her husband, my grandfather, who'd been dead six years at that point, in a neighborhood where people of color didn't live and that was not by accident. It was because for years it had been perfectly legal to discriminate in housing against folks of color. We didn't even make that against the law until 1968, the year that I was born. And for 20 years afterward, there were no real enforcement teeth or mechanisms in the Fair Housing Act. And even today, there's up to 3 million cases of housing discrimination against people of color every year. So even now, we don't really enforce the law. But back then, this family, my family, had been able to accumulate this property of such great value because they were white. And only because of that, having to do with nothing else, had we been anything but white, we wouldn't have had that house or any house even remotely like it. I wouldn't have gotten the 10 grand. I wouldn't have gone to Tulane, wouldn't have met those men, wouldn't have gotten that job. And the rest, as you can then imagine, would have been quite different in my life. Why am I telling you this? Very simply because it's important to note that where we are in life, not just me, but any of us, is in part because of our own effort, it is in part because of whatever abilities we may or may not have or develop over time, but it is also because of the social context into which we have been born. And in my case, and in the case of anyone born in this country or who has spent even a minute here, even if they were born somewhere else, is a context of institutionalized racism, profound racial inequality, and racialized privilege for members of the dominant group. It is a context that allowed one side of my family to enter this country in 1750, coming from Scotland, and within 10 years acquire over 10,000 acres of land. Land that first had to be stolen from First Nations peoples, the indigenous peoples of this country, who were not going to be allowed to keep it. And then, of course, also could not be owned by the people of African descent who'd been working on that land for 125 years by the time the McLean family of Western Scotland ever set foot on this land. At a time when black folks couldn't even own their own name, my family was going to get 10,000 acres simply because they were of the right lineage and the right descent and had the right skin color. And it's a social context that allowed the other side of my family, the Jewish immigrant side from Russia that didn't even come until the first few years of the 20th century, in spite of the discrimination they faced because of religion, ethnicity, nationality, lack of English language skills, strange customs, etc. Nonetheless, in spite of all that, a context that allowed my great grandfather the day that he got off the boat to get jobs in New York City that were off limits to people who were of color. And in fact, his very ability to enter the United States in the early 1900s was contingent on him being white or of European descent, because at that time we had very intense immigration restrictions in place dating back to the 1880s that really weren't lifted until 1965. So even his ability to come here and catch hell, and as they say, you know, all European immigrants love to tell you their family came here with 80 cents and a ball of lint in their pocket. But our ability to use that 80 cents and that ball of lint and turn that into something required first that we be able to come. And the only way we would be able to come in that period from 1880 until 1965 with only a very limited percentage of exceptions to that rule was to be quote unquote white. That's the social context that makes everything else possible. Why do I tell you this? As the beginning of my speech, it's important to be honest, both as individuals and as a nation about who we are and how we got here, individually and collectively. Because for too long we have lied, and we continue to lie. We lie to ourselves and we lie to our children in this country, believing in this notion of meritocracy, this idea that all you gotta do is work hard and you'll make it. If you didn't make it, it's your own fault. You didn't work hard enough, and if you did make it, it must be because of your own effort, your own initiative, your own willpower. And we believe this lie, and it's not just a myth, it is an out and out falsehood despite the existence of historically embedded structures of inequality, 
which we know if we're being honest, have given some a head start and have subjected others to headwinds. You see, the story that I told about my family is not just about my family. Were it so, I wouldn't have told it to you because it would have been purely self-indulgent. It is the story at some level of all white Americans because anyone born in this country, anyone born in this country who is white before 1964 was legally elevated above all persons of color without exception only in 1964 did we even begin to pretend that we believed about equality by passing the Civil Rights Act. Prior to that, we didn't even front. We didn't even fake it. All right. So anyone born before 1964 was legally elevated if they were white above all persons of color without exception. It is not an arguable point. And any of the descendants of those persons born before 1964, of which I am one, reaped the benefits of that prior head start. I will give you just two examples of what I mean programmatically to make the point. There are many more that if we had a semester, we could focus on. But these two will be sufficient for our purposes. Beginning in 1862, when the Homestead Act was passed by the United States Congress, an act that allowed families to acquire up to 160 acres of land, most of it west of the Mississippi, for only $10 down. Land that, of course, had to be taken from indigenous people, right? had their food supply destroyed, as in the Plain States, including the one where you are now. Right? And then that land was redistributed to people who staked homesteads, but virtually none of those homesteads were obtained by people of color. Not just the indigenous persons whose land was being taken, but by black folks or by Latinos whose you know, half of Mexico, northern Mexico, stolen as well in a war that this country started. Those homesteads were available in practice almost only for white families because the government wouldn't defend the homestead if a family of color wanted to go stake a claim. You could try it, you could do it, but the government wouldn't enforce or back up your claim to a homestead. So over a period of 50, 60, 70 years, 240 million acres of land, farmland mostly, passed into the hands of white families that was loaned to them, given to them, bought by them preferentially in an act that if we used honest language, we would call affirmative action, but we don't believe in honest language. And so we don't call it that. We only call things affirmative action or racial preference when they benefit people of color. But if you have an entire institutionalized policy to give land to white people, 245 million acres of it, land that is currently being lived on today by 45 million white folks still living on that land that their ancestors obtained solely because they were white, we don't call that racial preference or affirmative action. We call that good macroeconomic policy. That's just one policy. Then from the 1930s to the 1960s, the first 30 years of the FHA loan program, the Federal Housing Administration's loan program, one that if you're not familiar with it now, you probably will be at some point, because it's how most of us get our first house. It's great terms. You don't have to put very much money down. I think it's like 5%. The interest is really low. That's how most people get their first house. And the program has been around since the 30s. But for the first 30 years of the program, it was almost exclusively a program that could be accessed by white folks because the banks were using an underwriting criteria during that period that was racially exclusive against people of color. It basically said you couldn't get one of these loans Keep in mind, these are government guaranteed loans, in effect, subsidized loans, right? Because if you default, the government backs it up. That's why the banks were willing to lend the money to people who otherwise wouldn't have qualified for the loans, because they knew that if you defaulted, the, the taxpayers were going to bail it out, basically, right? Government subsidized guaranteed loans, but the first 30 years, those rules said that you couldn't get one of those loans if giving it to you would reduce the racial or cultural homogeneity of a neighborhood which is basically a fancy way of saying black and brown folks ain't getting this money to live in white neighborhoods because it would reduce the homogeneity. And then they had another rule that said you couldn't get one of these loans if you lived in a neighborhood of declining quality. And every black neighborhood and every Latino neighborhood in the United States was rated as a neighborhood of declining quality, which meant basically people of color, in this case blacks and Latinos especially, were not going to get any of this government guaranteed money. $120 billion worth of housing equity was loaned preferentially to 15 to 20 million white families in the first 30 years alone, affecting or benefiting 45 to 50 million white individuals. When you put these two laws alone together, we're talking about close to 100 million white folks, which is about half of all the white folks in the country who have benefited from those two racial preferences alone, to say nothing of others, 
And it's among the reasons why today the average white family in this country, not the average rich white family, but the average white family has 14 times the accumulated net worth of the average black family, 11 times the accumulated net worth of the average Latino family, and the ratio between white families and indigenous families, American Indian families, is so great it can't even be calculated because that indigenous net worth tends to be negative and you can't calculate a positive against a negative in that fashion and even come up with a proper ratio. So that wasn't because of harder work. It wasn't because of a better morality or a better work ethic or better genius or intelligence or better DNA. It was because of the head starts afforded to some and the head wins put upon others. Another reason it's important to start with this and to lead with this in a speech of this nature is that too long, what we've done as a country is we've looked at race issues when we do, and we don't do it that often, but when we do it, honestly, we tend to only do it from the perspective of who's down, that is to say, who's getting hurt, which is important, right? We need to know who's getting racially profiled and who's getting discriminated against in housing and who's getting tracked into the remedial classes in school. And all of that is important, but we can't only look at it from that perspective because if some are being targeted for mistreatment, then by definition, those who are not are elevated, right? You can't have a down without an up, but we don't talk about it that way. Even when we engage the issue of race, nice white liberal people, you know, who are willing to engage the issue of race, for what they're worth, they tend to do it by saying, well, it's really horrible these people are being mistreated. My God, I wish that would stop, without ever engaging the reality that, as a result, they themselves, we as members of the dominant group, are given a certain advantage because we're not the targets of that discrimination. We're not the targets of that racial profiling, et cetera. And it's important to acknowledge that flip side of discrimination, the privilege piece, because it avoids what I call the innocence trap. And you know what this is, even if you've never heard it called by that name. The innocence trap is this trap that we fall into sometimes when we talk about race, where we say, well, I know all this stuff and it's terrible. Oh my God, it's awful. I wish that hadn't happened. Oh my God, those 240 million acres and that $120 billion worth of equity and all that discrimination and slavery and the theft of Mexico and the killing of 90% of all indigenous persons of the Americas. My God, it's awful, but dot, 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 I didn't do it. So can we talk about something else? Right, this is the innocence trap. This is, I didn't do it. I didn't own any slaves. Yeah, I know how damn old you are. I didn't kill any Indians. Yeah, I know how damn old you are. I didn't lock up any Japanese Americans in World War II. I know that too. Not the point. And the whole point of me starting off the speech that way is to make the point that it's not the point. Because it doesn't matter what you did if you reap the legacy of either the beneficiary of or to the detriment of your well-being, the legacy of what has gone on before. See, we've been misled in this country to think that inertia is just a property of the physical universe, right? But it is also a property of the economic universe, the social, political, and cultural universe. So what happens in prior generations doesn't stop happening to the generations coming after it. History is not like a video game where we hit reset and start over again because we didn't like the outcome of the first time we played it. Right? Things continue to happen, and that which happens prior to our coming into the scene continues to affect us today. And so we're implicated in it, even if we didn't create the problem. And if we don't talk about that flip side, the privilege piece, the advantage piece, then it's easy to fall into the innocence trap. If we talk about it honestly and forthrightly, then we can move forward and actually take responsibility for the conditions that we find, even if we didn't create those conditions. There's a big difference between guilt and responsibility. Sometimes we assume that those are synonymous, but they're not. They're actually two different concepts, albeit related concepts. But sometimes, and I guess the point of this is the speech, and the title's not up there now, but you saw it when you came in, is that race is not a card, which is the thing that we sometimes say when we don't want to have this conversation, right? St as in, I wish you would stop playing the race card. First of all, can we just have an honest conversation here for just a second? about that kind of asininity, because really, that comment is as asinine as anything a person could say. Do we really think that people of color, in a society where nobody ever believes them when they claim to be the victims of racism, are really gonna pull that card out of their ass like it's gonna work? Like people of color actually gonna say, oh, I'll show you, I'll pull out the race card, as if white people are gonna go, oh, well, now that you played that one, yes, whatever you want. I mean, 
This is a country where when people of color bring up racism, they get vilified for it. They get attacked for it. They're not believed. Nobody bows down or does anything. If anything, they get criticized for playing the race card. That isn't much of a card. That's like, that's like being in a game and you're like, watch this. Here's the two of diamonds. Ha! The two of diamonds? That doesn't do anything. The two of diamonds, right? That's not much of a card. But the ability to shut down the conversation by saying, stop playing the race card, that's the best card of all. That's the trump card. So race is not a card. It is sometimes the whole deck. And even worse, it determines who the dealer is and who gets dealt. And so we need to be having an honest conversation instead of trying to change the subject or shut down the conversation, which is what too oftentimes dominant group members do. And this is hard for us to accept, man. Those of us who are white, we get very bent about this because we really want to compartmentalize race into the past and the present. So folks will say, yes, Tim, I recognize all that stuff you just said may very well be true and it's terrible, but that was then and this is now and we need to move on. How very easy for us to say. Because those who are not the targets of oppression can always move on. We already moved on, man. Been done. Did it years ago. But folks who are being the targets of oppressive behavior, be it folks of color with regard to race, be it women with regard to gender, be it poor and working class folks with regard to class, people with disabilities on the basis of ableism, be it people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender on the basis of sexual orientation, be it people who are not Christian in terms of religious supremacy and the, and the effects of being anything other than Christian in a Christian dominated society. Note, I didn't say a Christian society, but a Christian dominated society. Right? For those who are not in the dominant group, it's a lot harder to just move on because the minute they move on, somebody moves on them and puts them back in that place from which they were told to pay no attention you know, to the man behind the curtain. But before I present the evidence to you that racism and privilege are still very much modern and not past phenomena, let me point out something about this white denial. The most important lesson of all about that denial is that it's intergenerational. Now, there'll be lots of things I've already said with which you'll disagree. There's gonna be more, I assure you, for some of you. But there's gonna be one thing I'm gonna say right now that I bet no one in this room would disagree with. In fact, I guarantee it. Because if you did disagree with it, you'd be too embarrassed to admit you disagreed with it. It's just that silly to disagree. Here's what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say the following very uncontroversial thing. In 1962 and 1963, People of color were treated profoundly unequally in this society relative to white people. See, none of you looked at me like, oh, what are you talking about, man? 1962, I think that was a pretty good time to be black in this country, and a pretty good time to be Latino or Asian or indigenous to the Americas, because you know better, right? This is before the Civil Rights Act, before the Voting Rights Act, before the immigration restrictions were lifted in 65, before the Fair Housing Act. So you see, it's real easy for us now to say what I just said. Oh yeah, 1962 and 63, woo, back in the day, it was rough. Oh, that was terrible, my God. Because see, 40 some odd years in the past, it's no sweat off our back to admit that. That's easy, it doesn't cost us anything. But now here's the deal. What do you think white Americans said? In 1962 and 63, when the question was put to them, do you think that people of color, they use the term racial minorities in the polling then, but do you think minorities are treated equally in your community? Do you think they have equal educational opportunity? Do you think they have equal housing opportunity, et cetera? Because see, in retrospect, we would know that the answer is, well, of course not, fool. Of course they weren't treated equally, but now here's the deal. In 1962, when white Americans were asked that very same question, what do you think they said? Well, 70% in 1962 said, oh yeah, people of color, racial minorities, whatever term, treated perfectly equally in our communities. Now in retrospect, we can realize that's a delusion. So removed from the real world as to boggle the mind, but there it was, and the people who said it were genuine, they believed it. They honestly, sincerely felt it. The next year, 1963, 85% of white folks when asked, do you think that black children have equal educational opportunity in your community, said sure. In 1963, people, 85% said, oh yeah, it's all good. So what does this suggest? It suggests that in any generation you wanna pick, the dominant group has always had the luxury of not knowing the truth has always had the luxury of not knowing what people of color have to know because it's the reality in which they live. If you go back to the 30s, white folks didn't think racism was a big deal then. Go back to the 1890s, in the midst of the reinstitutionalization of white supremacy in the South and the conclusion of the conquest and genocide of indigenous peoples, not really the conclusion because it continues today, but the conclusion of what we like to call the Indian Wars. 
the late 1800s. And what did people, did, did white folks then have a big hard time with what was going on? No. They would, write, they would write editorials in newspapers saying, well, we get along fine with our Negroes down here in the South if you Yankees would just leave us alone, or they would justify the slaughter of indigenous people because we would make better use of the land than they would, right? So we never thought, we never thought it was a big deal in every generation, and in every generation we've been wrong. And in every generation, people of color have said this is a big deal, and in every generation they've been right. So unless it can be demonstrated that people of color who in every previous generation accurately recognized racism for what it was have suddenly become irrational and subsequently that whites who have never gotten it right yet have suddenly become the insightful ones, then the best advice that I think can be given on the issue of is racism a problem or not, if you want to know the answer to that, the best advice I can give you is probably you don't want to ask a lot of white people. And it's not because white people are bad, evil, mean, nasty, or incapable of seeing the truth. It's just that we have no reason to see the truth. 86% of whites in the country at large, and certainly a much higher percentage in places like Montana, live in communities where there are hardly any people of color around them. So it's out of sight, out of mind. It's not that we're bad people, insensitive, uncaring as a group. It's just that we don't see what is going on, and then it becomes harder to believe. And of course, we're not tested on it, right? If white people don't know black and brown reality, what happens to us? Nothing. We're not tested on it. We don't have to know. If people of color don't know white reality, all hell breaks loose for them. Oh no, they gotta know white reality. They gotta read white literature, white history. They gotta learn about white art, white theater, white poetry, right? White politics and governmental leaders. Now we don't call it that. We don't say it's white literature or white history because the racial norm doesn't have to be named. It just is considered normal. So we have Black History Month and white folks, you know, bright young people who probably got better SAT scores than I did will raise their hands on me in February and say, why do we have to have Black History Month? We don't have White History Month, which is some nonsense that you can only say because you have the luxury of not recognizing that every month since you popped out of your mama's womb was White History Month. We just have these tricky words that we use to cover up that fact. So we call it May, June, <laughs> July, August in September, but it ignores the fact that what we're learning in all those times that we're not specifying that we're gonna learn about people who are quote unquote different is the dominant narrative. And if people of color don't learn that narrative, they don't progress very far in this society. To be a person of color is to have to go through white folks because it's white folks who have the institutional power. To be white is to not have to do anything with regard to people of color if you don't want to. That's real privilege. That's a real advantage. For people of color, man, it's like that kid in sixth sense that sees dead people. To be a person of color in this country is to see white people, because we're sort of everywhere. We're like Visa, we're everywhere you want to be. So people of color can't very well ignore that reality, but we can, and so we end up being ignorant even when we're well intended to the realities of what's going on. What are those realities? Well, the evidence is quite clear. Three years ago, four years ago now, I guess, Two researchers, one at the University of Chicago, one at MIT, both of them economists, conducted a really quite brilliant study, groundbreaking study, where they were trying to determine the extent of job discrimination in the labor market, and just the labor market, uh, with regard to whites versus blacks. Now this study, by the way, could be done right now with whites and Latinos, whites and indigenous persons, whites and Asian Pacific Americans, whites and Arab Americans right now, and I think you'll see when I explain the study to you how it would have probably had very similar outcomes. This particular study was just white and black. What the study did was they, they fabricated 5,000 resumes. These weren't real people, but they made them look real on a computer program, and they sent these resumes out to 1,500 different employers who were advertising for job openings in three large metropolitan areas around the country. And what they did was they made sure that when they sent out the resumes that they were evenly matched and paired in terms of qualifications. So they had the same kind of work experience, the same level of seniority, the same quality education. In every regard of merit, they were indistinguishable. The only distinguishable difference between the resumes that were sent to any given company were the names at the top. So half of the resumes were given stereotypically white names, the other half were given stereotypically black names. And what they found was that simply having a white sounding name gave you a 50% better chance of getting a call back for a job interview than having a stereotypically black name even when all the qualifications were identical. 
which is important for two reasons. Number one, it suggests that there is an ongoing barrier to people in this case who were merely suspected of blackness, haven't even walked in and shown themselves to be black yet. They just think you might be, and that's enough for them to disregard your actual qualifications. But it also goes a long way toward disproving and debunking this notion of reverse discrimination that we hear so much about, because if indeed the labor market of the United States was all about screwing white people, right? If it was all about reverse discrimination and white folks just can't get a job, which is just preposterous when you look at the Labor Department data that suggests that folks of color have two to three times the unemployment rate of white folks, no matter whether the economy is good or bad at any given moment. So it's silly on its face, but this study certainly disproved it because this would have been a great study to prove reverse discrimination if it was really a serious problem because they had the resumes right there. They could have easily said, oh my God, oh my God, Tamika has applied for the job. We got to get her in. Oh my God, Jamal, I know he's black. We got to have some black people get him in. But what'd you say her name was, Skylar? Oh, hell no. Chloe, nuh-uh, nuh-uh, nuh-uh. That's a white girl. Biff, uh-uh. Brad, white. Don't want him, don't need him. Now I'm making fun of it. We know that's not what happened, right? But it could have. And if the labor market was all about reverse discrimination where folks had just got to hire black people, that's what they would have done, but they didn't. They still passed on those folks of color, even when they were equally qualified. It's not just the job market, though. Let's talk briefly about the criminal justice system. Most people don't know this, but in 1964, two-thirds of all the people locked up in this country were white. Only one-third were people of color. By 1994, those numbers had exactly reversed so that by then and still today, two-thirds of all inmates in this country are now people of color, only one-third are white. There are only two possible theories to explain this. There is not a third. Theory number one, sometime around 1965, white folks woke up from a deep criminal slumber and said to ourselves, well, now you know what? We are out of control with this crime stuff. My God, we really need to stop. We are filling up jail cells faster than they can build them. We've got to shape up and fly right, as my mama used to say. And then the corollary to this is that black and brown folks, hearing that, you know, we white folks were retiring from crime, said to themselves, well, now, hell, if they're not going to do it, maybe we'll go in there and do it because somebody's got to do crime and it might as well be us. Indeed, that would explain it. Sometime after 1964, white people just decided to shape up and black and brown folks went crazy. But of course, that's not what happened, which brings us to theory two, and now I've spoiled it for you because it's not one, it is indeed two, that in fact, the share of crime done by people of color as a percentage of all crime did not change to any appreciable degree in that 40 some odd year period. The share of crime done by whites did not change to any appreciable degree during that 40 some odd year period. What did change was the way that we deployed criminal justice resources. Increasingly and disproportionately, in regard to the war on drugs, though not only with regard to the war on drugs against people of color. Let's be clear, the war on drugs is not a war on drugs. And this I can say with some level of confidence, because if the war on drugs had been about drugs, I also would not be here this evening giving you this speech. And I can speak to this now because the statute of limitations has expired on this thing. <laughs> the drug war was not about drugs, because had it been so, it would have seen as one of its primary battlefields the eighth floor of Monroe Hall at Tulane University, specifically room 804, <laughs> from the fall of 1986 until the spring of 1987, and then room 237 of the same dorm the following year. And I'm not saying this to glamorize drug use, I'm just reminiscing, so stick with me. The war on drugs instead is about control of certain populations because you see, the New Orleans police were far too busy shaking down black people in the city of New Orleans who made the mistake of doing their drugs somewhere other than my dorm room. If they had just come uptown and hung out with me, they'd have been fine. Nothing would have happened to them. According to the Department of Justice and the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the Centers for Disease Control, African Americans are only 13% of the drug users in this country, the same as their share of the population. Latinos are 10% of the drug users. That's less than their share of the population. Non-Hispanic whites are 74% of all the drug users in this country. That's more than our share of the population, which is to say that per capita, whites are more likely than African Americans or Latinos to use drugs, and yet African Americans and Latinos combined make up approximately 90% of the people incarcerated for drugs in this country each year while white folks, 74% of the folks breaking the law, less than 10% of the people incarcerated in a given year for a drug possession offense. The Justice Department just released a report that found that black and Latino males are three times more likely than white males to have their cars stopped and searched for drugs, 
by law enforcement, even though white males are four times more likely to actually have drugs in our car on the occasions when we are searched, which means that racial profiling isn't just racist, it's not particularly bright law enforcement. If your goal is to get drugs off the street, which again begs the question, is that really the purpose? Because to believe that, you'd have to believe that cops just keep on stopping black and brown folks, even though they know the data says they should be stopping white folks. Do we really think they're that stupid that they just stop crying? Oh my God, I stopped another black guy. What the hell's wrong with me? I knew it was white people. I got to write that down, put it on a post-it note on my dashboard. It's white people, white people, white people. Ugh, oh, I stopped a Latino. Damn. Oh, what am I going to do? I mean, come on. Do we really think? that law enforcement is just that stupid or is there something else going on, that this is a mechanism of intimidation and social control. It's either vast incompetence or it's serving some function beyond merely incompetence. There are two to three million cases of housing discrimination a year, again, as I said before. And so whether we're looking at housing, criminal justice, labor, education, many other examples we could speak of, healthcare disparities, the evidence that racism continues to plague us is quite clear. And then the flip side of that has to be clear as well. The flip side of privilege. It's not just that that's two to three million more houses I can live in, though it is that. It's not just the better job opportunities. It's not just the ability to engage in illegal activity like drug use, knowing that I'm probably not going to get caught, though it is that. It's also the psychological benefit of not having to worry that somehow my race is going to give an indication of illegality or incompetence or a lack of intelligence or a lack of ethics when I'm applying for a job, trying to get a loan at a bank, or raising my hand in a classroom to answer a question. How many times do I need to go to a college campus where I meet people of color who talk about being one of one or one of two people of color in a given classroom, and how they honestly are worried that if they raise their hand to answer a question and get it wrong, that now they have to represent for the entire group? This realization that if they bomb a test, that there may be somebody who thinks it's because they are a person of color and thus less intelligent, a something that no white person in this room or any other room has ever felt, that somehow that my whiteness was gonna be implicated when I bombed the test or got a question wrong. Now, there are some studies on gender which suggest that women as women, including white women, have that experience when it comes to gender, right? Certainly, so for example, studies have found that young women in math and science classes who know what the stereotypes are, about young uh, women and, and girls when it comes to math and science starting at an early age, oftentimes underperform and don't participate in class as much because there's this realization, conscious or subconscious, that they don't want to confirm a negative stereotype if they get a question wrong. That's something men don't worry about. If I bomb a question, nobody's going to say, well, it's just men. They're not very good at math and science. We all know that. Right? That's something that the privileged group doesn't have to sweat. We're also not worried about being labeled based on the worst representatives of our group. So Tim McVeigh says nothing about white people and our propensity to terrorism, nor does Terry Nichols, nor does the Unabomber, nor does the Olympic Park bomber, Eric Rudolph, nor do the 120 white folks who are suspected of or have been caught and convicted of bombing or burning abortion clinics in the past 20 years in this country. None of them signify a propensity for white people to engage in terrorism or even white so-called Christians claiming to be Christians who engaged in th those acts of terror. It doesn't say anything about white Christians as a group, and we would never allow it to. We would never allow white Christians to suddenly be profiled every time they tried to rent a truck for fear they were going to do a Tim McVeigh, Terry Nichols thing, or any time they went near a family planning clinic. But let 19 Arab Muslims fly planes into buildings, and we have otherwise intelligent people running around insisting that we profile anyone who could possibly be Arab, anyone who might be Muslim, because after all, Tim, they really were all Arab and they really were all Muslim. Yeah, that's right, 19 of them. And there are one and a half billion Muslims on planet Earth. That is the walking, talking definition of a non-representative sample. And for those who haven't taken a class in research design, let me just clue you in. If you make a conclusion about what's likely to happen next on the basis of an unrepresentative sample of the whole, you're engaging in what is called sampling error. It is the epitome of statistical illiteracy, and you're just as likely to be wrong the next time as you are to be right. So it's not smart. But we got people demanding it in ways they never would have after McVeigh and Nichols and in ways that we know they didn't. That's a real privilege. We have the privilege of being presumed innocent even when we're not as innocent as we claim. So for example, if I were to ask you to think about youth in three places, and by youth now, I mean high school age people. Youth in three places, Montana, Los Angeles as a city, and New York City as a city, okay? 
and to ask of those youth, either throughout the state of Montana, in LA, or in New York, which youth are more likely to carry a weapon, more likely to take a gun into their school, more likely to use illegal drugs, more likely to drink underage, more likely to binge drink and drive drunk, more likely to be raped, more likely to be assaulted by a boyfriend. If I were to ask you, and if I were to ask just about anybody out there in the larger society, not just in Montana, by the way, even in LA and even in New York, I bet you that the vast majority would say, well, of course, those in LA and New York, I mean, by God, those are you know, big cities with all kinds of pathological behaviors and destructive behaviors and youth that are out of control and they're in gangs and we've seen all that on TV. But in fact, according to the Centers for Disease Control, they compile this data every year. You can find it online. It's in the youth online data of the CDC. Montana youth are far more likely than youth in either Los Angeles or New York City or virtually any other big city you want to choose or any other state that has uh, far more people of color in it, for example more likely to carry a weapon, more likely to take a gun to school, more likely to use drugs, more likely to drink and to binge drink, more likely to be sexually assaulted or raped, and more likely to be assaulted by a partner than those in those big cities, Montana youth. Doesn't mean that we ought to start stereotyping Montana youth or Wyoming youth, who are even worse, according to the CDC, or Idaho youth who aren't far behind. Not that we ought to start profiling such persons, we ought not. But it is interesting, is it not, that we've got stereotypes about who's pathological, who's dangerous, who's destructive, who engages in bad behavior, and those stereotypes are directly related to things like race in a way that tends to stereotype the quote-unquote ghetto, right, and ignore the pathologies of so-called middle America and so-called heart of America and the so-called, you know, places like this that qualify as supposedly safer and better places. Maybe they are, maybe they're not, but there's some real stuff going on in such places that we still have the privilege of not being tagged with, not being tagged with. And so even when that report comes out, it made the news like three weeks ago, this thing I'm quoting from now, this study that talked about youth in these various states like uh, Montana and Idaho and Wyoming. When that study came out, we know that even though the data says that's the group more likely to do all this stuff, that indeed there's not going to be now a, nation, a nationwide national stereotype about such persons. It's not going to all of a sudden flip where people are going to say, well, I'm not going to Montana. I'm, I'm not taking a trip to Idaho. Uh, Snake River Canyon, screw it. I'm not going uh, because there are some crazy ass white people there and um, they're going to shoot me. Uh, try to sell me drugs, uh, run me over because they're drunk driving, because they're all out drinking, because they got nothing else to do. In fact, what's interesting is the study that came out, it was reported nationwide, and the articles about it were very interesting, because they all tried to excuse the pathology. It was very interesting. The rhetoric was, well, the reason that they do that in Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho is because there's nothing to do, so they're bored. I don't deny that. I bet that's true. But let me tell you something. If I were to tell you that there are folks in LA that join gangs because they're bored and got nothing else to do, you think anybody's gonna buy that excuse? Anybody's gonna think, well, that makes sense or that they're gonna feel sorry for them? Or kids that go out and tag graffiti in big cities and they, because they're bored, they got nothing else to do. Nobody's gonna say, oh, poor, poor folks, they're, they're bored. Gosh, we really ought to understand them more. But this article was done with all kinds of sympathy for the people engaged in behaviors that are really quite pathological and destructive. And if it was kids of color in big cities doing it, no such sympathy would be conjured up. So that's the flip side of the privilege piece. Now, here's what I want to close with, though. Because so far, all I've done is tell you that there are these privileges. And I remember several years ago when I started giving this talk, people of color would be like, uh, OK, uh, thanks, Tim, for reminding all these white people how good they have it. Thanks a lot, because now why in the hell would they want to give that up? It's like we wanted to keep that secret, you know? You didn't need to go tell them. Now they're going to really think, well, why would I want to give it right? Because this culture doesn't tell you to give away your advantage. That's not nothing in, in it for you to give away your edge, right? So they sort of were like, thanks, but no thanks. Um, so I started thinking about, well, gosh, that's a really good question. Why would people with privilege want to give it up? Because that's important. If you're going to be an ally and join this struggle, and, and, and if you're not just a saint that does it because of altruistic motives, and most of us aren't, you know. Most of us are worried about our own well-being, and, and this culture encourages that self-interest rationale. Um, then if you don't have a reason, it's going to be pretty hard to expect a movement to be built around ending racism. But I'll tell you what. The evidence is actually, I think, quite clear that indulging these privileges 
continuing to reap them, going along with the system that gives them to us, even though it benefits us dramatically in relative terms, and I never want to diminish how significant the privileges are, there's still a cost to be paid for indulging them. And it's a cost that we might want to reconsider as being too high, because I want to suggest to you that indulging privilege can actually hurt us as well, those of us who are white. I'll just give you two examples. There are many more we could do if we had time, and my book goes into some of them. The first is that when you have the privilege of mobility, knowing that you're not going to be discriminated, for example, in housing because of your race, you can move wherever you want. So if you want to leave the city because it's getting too crowded, too dangerous, which are sometimes code words that we use for class and race, you can move to the suburbs, you can move to a rural area, and you're not really worried that you're going to be discriminated against in housing on the basis of race. You can take it for granted that's not going to happen. People of color can't, so that's a privilege. Then you can move to those places and feel safe because you have the privilege of saying, I'm in an area where bad things really don't happen because we're away from danger, because we know what danger looks like and it doesn't look like us. That's a privilege that we have indulged for a very long time. And you know what? Usually that works. But sometimes it doesn't. So we move from Denver to Littleton, Colorado and enroll our kids at Columbine High School because it's a good, safe place to send your kids to school. Or we move from San Diego to Santee, California. We move from Portland, Oregon to Springfield slash Eugene. We move from Jackson, Mississippi to Pearl, Mississippi. We move from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas to Jonesboro. We move from these places that are larger and darker and maybe poorer to these places that are more affluent and whiter and we think we're safe and then we let down our guard, do we not, sometimes, to the dangers actually lurking in the community. Privilege allows us to think that we're safe. Privilege allows us the mobility to even make that move and then privilege says nothing to worry about and then your kids are building 35 bombs in the basement to blow up their school and nobody even knows it. In fact, these two young men at Columbine in 99, Klebold and Harris, go in to class two months before they do the deed and kill 13 people, including themselves, they go into class and they show a video where they act out the murder of their classmates on film for a grade. They made a movie for a class where they act out mass murder. And I mean, they go into class. This is like they show this for a grade. Just imagine. Yes, this is a, a movie called uh, We Blow Up Columbine High. And Nothing happened to them. The teacher didn't call the parents like, something's wrong with your kids. They didn't call the cops. You know, it's just, you can sort of envision the teacher just, wow, that's fantastic use of light and sound. What fantastic cinematography, brilliant, B plus, whatever. But now if two black kids at Columbine, there were only five, if two black kids at Columbine enrolled into class with a video where they acted out the mass murder of all these white people, because that's who it would have been, what do you think would have happened? Like these kids roll in, they're like, uh, yeah, teacher, this is our movie. It's called The Day We Kill All Y'all. <laughs> Hope you like it. Somebody's parents would have been called, but that phone call would have been like this. Come pick up your children. They are in jail because they would have called the cops first. They would have seen it as a danger. But see, these were nice white kids from nice families with money and good jobs. They don't mean it. They're just talking. The day the SWAT team showed up at Columbine, I know this because a SWAT team member actually wrote to me a couple years after it happened, and he'd read an article I'd written about this. He said, you know, when we showed up at Columbine High School, we were ready to take the building. The shots were still going off. We thought we could save somebody's life. We weren't sure, but that's what we're trained to do. It's our job. We figured, let's go, let's go. We got the shields, we got our guns, we got our masks. We're ready to go. Our commanding officer stops us, won't let us take the building. We ask him why he says, and this is a direct quote, because these are white people with money and nice cars. And if you go into this building and somebody dies because of your actions, they will sue us blind. And so they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and finally the shots stopped, and then they took the building. Now, we don't know whether they could have saved anybody. There's a real distinct possibility they wouldn't have. But isn't it ironic that the one thing that guaranteed they couldn't save anyone was the very thing they had come to count on for so long, the privilege of being treated different and better than other folks, the privilege of having themselves deferred to, to having their rear ends kissed because they were the right color, the right class, and drove the right kind of car. See, privilege works 364 days out of the year, but if day 365 is April 20th of 1999 and you got a kid at Columbine High, you really don't care about the other 364, and God forbid day 365 is 9-11, because that's a global Columbine. We didn't talk about it like it, but we should have. Because see, when 9-11 happened, man, I watched a lot of TV after that. Kept watching all these people being interviewed. Everybody's in shock, everybody's in trauma, everybody's upset, everybody's scared, whether they're white, whether they're people of color. But there was a distinct difference between the way white folks talked about that trauma and the way folks of color did. Because I tell you what, I didn't see any people of color walking around asking this question, why do they hate us? Why? 
Why? Why would anyone hate the United States of America? No people of color were walking around asking this. Because people of color have always had a love-hate relationship with the country, loving certain things about it, but hating the things that have been done and that we still haven't made recompense for and don't even want to talk about. People of color know what it is to be hated, know what it is to be hunted, know what it is to be the victims of terrorism. 9-11 wasn't new for everybody. Folks said, oh, the world changed. For who, man? Because some people, only thing new about 9-11 was it came from another country and not the other side of town. Right? The other side of the railroad tracks. Someone in your own community who didn't think that you belong there. So white folks had a double trauma. Right? The trauma that everybody had. And then the trauma of, I don't understand why would anyone hate. Because privileged people have never had to think about that before. Privileged people, see, people who are marginalized and targeted for oppression, they have to know what other people think of them. That's how they stay alive. So if you're a person of color, you got to think, like, what is that white person over there thinking about me? How are they going to respond if I move into the neighborhood, if I work at this company, if I go to this school? you you got to sort of be on guard. Privileged people don't have to think about that because they can just say, <laughs> you don't like me? What you going to do? We spend $400 billion a year on defense, fool. What are you going to do to us? We are big and bad, and we will kick your ass. We will bomb you back to the Stone Age if you touch us. Don't you know? And if you're already in the Stone Age, we will take you back to whatever came before the Stone Age because we can. So take your best shot. And then 19 guys with, what, $30 worth of box cutters and a couple hundred dollars worth of plane tickets said, cool, y'all spend your $400 billion a year on defense, and me and my boys are bringing these buildings down. How do you like us now? So privilege let us down. Privilege allowed us to not even have to even ask the question, let alone ever think about what the answer might be, because we don't have to care why people hate us. And no reason for hating us could justify killing 3,000 innocent people, just like no reason for hating them can justify killing 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 times more than that in Afghanistan and Iraq. But the point being, the point being that privileged people have the luxury of staying in that bubble that says, we don't have to care until you do. And then when it comes back to bite you on the ass because the guard was let down because we thought, ah, eh, we're number one, man. Like the song says, we'll put a boot in your ass. It's the American way. That didn't work. And it's not working now. But see, privileged people finally asked the question, why do they hate us? And then privileged people came up with a really brilliant answer articulated by the king of the privileged people who says, who says, who says, I know why they hate us. They hate us because of our freedoms. Now that's some privileged ass stuff right there because only privileged people think they are free. Everybody else knows better. They did not go to Pine Ridge and ask Lakota peoples on Pine Ridge, why do you think they came for us? Because Lakota folks are not gonna sit there and go, well, fool, it's obviously because of all of these freedoms. <laughs> They didn't go into South Chicago, South Central LA. They didn't go into the heart of any major city in this country. They didn't go to East Los Angeles and ask Latino folks there, why do you think 9-11 had? Well, what kind of stupid question is that? It's all these freedoms that I'm bathing in every day. <laughs> and then privileged people say, oh, and I've got the answer. We'll, we'll make it stop. I know how we can stop them. We'll kill more of them. That'll stop them. And they'll love us for it. So we're going to invade a country that had nothing to do with it. And watch, watch, watch. They're going to throw roses at our feet. They're going to, this is what Rumsfeld said, man. They're going to greet us like liberators. Rumsfeld or Cheney, after a while, all these white men look alike to me. But one of them said, <laughs> they're going to throw rose petals at our feet and greet us as liberators. They'll see us as liberators. Yeah, even though we armed the guy that oppressed them for 20 years. Yeah, they're going to love us because we're going to give them candy bars and, and, and Christina Aguilera CDs and other worthless crap. Right. How's that working out? Not so good. There are families in this country, including some I know, who sadly are burying their children right now or are going to bury some in the coming months until this thing stops that are going to have to bury their kids because of that hubris, what the Greeks called it, right? This, this mentality of nothing can stop us. We are so caught up in our own goodness that we can't even see that other people might view us differently. And so that hubris, that mentality of entitlement, which comes from privilege, gets us in trouble, not just at home, but globally. It isn't working. It will get you killed. It is dangerous. It is dysfunctional. So if you want to know why we as members of the dominant group, in this case, white folks ought to care about it, man, it's not just because we want to do it for, to help people of color, man. People of color will 
liberate themselves from white supremacy, just like women will ultimately liberate themselves from patriarchy and LGBT folks will liberate themselves from straight supremacy and working class people will liberate themselves from the class system. But it'd be nice to have some male allies, white allies, straight allies, allies who were middle class and above, who were at least also willing to carry some of the weight and not so as to be missionaries, not so as to do charity work, but to work in solidarity because it's coming back on us. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next week or next year, but it's coming back on us. And that ought to give us enough incentive. Let me close with a quick story and then take some questions. And I tell you this story for two reasons. Number one is it goes back to a theme I talked about before, but I think it crystallizes this theme of why we have to take responsibility for these problems, even if we're not guilty of having created them. So it makes that point, I think, anecdotally and symbolically very nicely. But it also is good life advice, and I'm sure you came here today to you know, get life advice from me. Um, so I wouldn't want to disappoint you. Um, here's the story. When I got out of college, I thought it'd be a really great idea to move into a big house with nine other people. I'm not sure what in the hell I was thinking. I'm fairly confident, though, that it had something to do with being broke. When you're broke, you'll do all kinds of stuff, like think to yourself, well, if we moved into a house with 10 people, we'd save a lot of money. Yeah, you, you will do that. We were living uh, in a big house, turned out to be haunted, uh, in New Orleans. So it should have been even cheaper than it was for that little uh, uh, addition. Uh, and that 11th roommate wasn't paying any rent. But <laughs> we had 10 people in a house that cost $525. I'm not good at math, but I can do that math. $52.50 a person. Can't beat it. And when you add utilities and sharing the cost of groceries and everything to that, it's still less than $100 a pop. So it was a great deal. But try this. Actually, don't. I'm just going to give you this. Don't. Don't do it. Because if you do it, you're going to learn about five or six weeks into this little experiment in communal love that you've concocted to save money, that you'd have been better off saving a little more money and just getting a place on your own, right? Because then you just have to clean up after yourself. You don't have to worry about other people. Because see, six weeks into this little thing, I come home from work one night, and I notice that one of my roommates is making dinner for the evening, because we didn't just share grocery expenses. We also cook for each other. And he's cooking dinner on the left front burner of the stove. He's making gumbo, because this is New Orleans, and that's what you do. And man, it smelled good, and it looked good. It even had shrimp in it. Not many, because we were broke, but it had like three. And we were going to cut them up really small and dole them out. And when he asked me if I wanted some, normally I would have said, yeah, because like I said, it smelled good and it looked good, but I'd already eaten some dinner downtown before I came back home. And so I said, no, man, I'm not really hungry, but I'll tell you what, do me a favor, save me some, put it in Tupperware, put it in the fridge, I'll take it to work tomorrow because it looks great. He said, cool, I'll do it. I said, great. I went up to my room, watched some TV, did a little work that I needed to get done and went to sleep. Woke up about 7.30 the next morning to get my coffee, came downstairs, and I noticed that on the left front burner of that stove was still this pot of gumbo. And it, just sitting there, getting crusty, didn't smell as good as it had the night before, did not look as good as it had the night before. I was surely not going to eat it now. And he had saved no portion of it for me, even though he had told me he would. So I was upset on two levels. One, it had gone to waste. Two, it was a mess that he hadn't seen fit to clean up. He was leaving it for someone else. And so as angry as I was about that, I said, well, what the hell? I got like 15 minutes before I got to get the streetcar to go to work. So I'll just clean it, you know? So I grab it. I bring it over to the sink. I grab the brush. I grab the soap. I grab the, the sponge and the gloves, because I don't want to touch this stuff with my bare hands. It was really, really getting nasty, and I started to run the water right there under your left nostril. And he looked at me and said, because he's smart, because he went to college, and we all know that's what makes you smart. He said to me, Tim, I, uh, I didn't make the gumbo. I wasn't here last night for dinner. Were you here last night for dinner? Did you eat the gumbo, he said accusingly, and I said, no, not me. And now we both felt self-righteous, and we came to the conclusion jointly that it was neither his nor my responsibility to clean the mess. He said, Tim, would you like some lentils and rice? I said, yes, I would. And I ate my dinner, and I washed off my plate, and I went up to my room. I did a little work. I watched some TV. I went to bed. As you can tell, my social life was extremely active at this point. <laughs> Woke up the next morning. I'd, I'd forgotten to set an alarm. No alarm, but let me give you a little tip, and if you remember nothing else from tonight, which is possible, please remember at least this. If you're living in a house where a pot of gumbo has been sitting on the left front burner of your stove for 36 and a half hours, you're not going to need an alarm clock to wake you up. <laughs> because the smell is going to crawl out of the pot of gumbo 
on the legs that it has grown. And I'm now not speaking in metaphor or hyperbole. I mean it literally. It is going to crawl out of the pot, across the kitchen, across the living room, up the back stairs, down the back hall. It's going to go under your door frame or through your keyhole, and it is going to find with laser-like precision that thing on the front of your face you call the nose, and you will be awake. And now I was, and I was pissed because I knew what it meant. I knew what the smell meant. I knew what was waiting for me downstairs on the left front burner of that stove. So I throw open my door. I run down the hall. Keep in mind, I live with nine other people. Can't find one of them. And the guy that made the gumbo, he's like Bin Laden. Nobody knows where in the hell he is. <laughs> it's like he made the gumbo as a practical joke just to see how long it would take somebody else to clean it up, and then he skipped town. And I get to the bottom of the stairs, I look across the living room into the kitchen, I see the gumbo, and I am quite certain that the gumbo saw me. <laughs> and it was at that moment, not a moment earlier, but also not a moment after, that I realized and learned the most important lesson I'd ever learned prior to then or since, and not just about cleaning gumbo, but about anything. And the lesson was this, it really didn't matter anymore whether I had created the mess. It didn't really matter anymore whether I was guilty of having created this nasty, crusty gumbo, whether I was the author of all this unpleasantness as the literary line goes. All that mattered was that I was tired of living in the funk. And the same is true with human societies. When we get tired of living in the funk, in the residue of a system set up by someone else without our permission, but nonetheless a system that continues to affect the world in which we live and toxify the air that we breathe, then we'll clean up the mess, not because we caused it, but because we are responsible for what we do from this point forward. And I thank you for hanging out with me for so long, and I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you very much, and take care. Well, as promised, I went longer than I was supposed to, but that's just the way it works. Uh, I do want to take some, some questions and um, get some interaction going. We have a mic in the back, uh, sort of in the middle actually. If you don't want to get up and go, all, I mean it'd be great if you would go to it, I'm sure for the sake of the recording, but if you don't feel like doing it, no big deal, just speak as loudly as you can and then I will repeat or paraphrase the question for the sake of those who were recording it and for those in other parts of the room who might not be able to hear the question. And for those who have to leave, thank you so much for hanging out and um, as long as you leave with the least amount of volume so other folks who are going to ask questions can do so and hear the answers, that'd be great. Thank you again for coming. Anyone have questions? Usually no one wants to ask the first one, but someone inevitably does. So, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, cool. Great. Yeah, I, my name's Emmett. I really enjoyed your speech a lot, but I agreed with a lot of it. There's only one thing um, um, well, um, I'd like to disagree with you, and then I'd like um, kind of to add something that okay. you might not have touched on. When you talked about the race card, like you're, you're complaining about, you know, the race card, you know, everyone trumps the race card, but it is very important. As you said, the race card is one of the most important things, except there's a couple of times that the race card was used and it really didn't work as far as I'm concerned. You've, right. you've heard about the O.J. Simpson trial. Right, sure. They used race as the entire issue. They played the race card. O.J. Simpson was being persecuted because he's black. Right, the okay. white people set him up. Except I followed that and there was so much evidence against O.J. Simpson that, okay. you know, he was guilty as heck. They didn't need, there, this wasn't an issue of race. Okay. White people co commit a lot of crimes of murder. This was, right. too, and second okay. of all, I supported Michael Jackson very much. I'm right. a big Michael Jackson fan, but they even tried right. the race card. Right. Michael Jackson was persecuted because he was different, not right. because he was black. And there were a lot of white child molesters. Sure. Which brings me to my second point. I wish you'd, um, I've been a victim of injustice myself because I'm a punk rocker and right. I'm very different. I'm a very eccentric person who likes right. to talk about washing machines, dryers. I love children, right. I love firing lasers. Right. But right. I wish you'd also discuss more about not just race. It's not just race or right. class, but poverty can get you sure. real discriminated against. Sure. Being different. Oh, sure. sure. You know, I've been a victim. I got thrown out of one of my houses just because sure. I was a punk rocker. They said, no, no, it's not because you're a punk rocker. Of course right. it sure. is. Sure. Just because I'm different. So please also address that too. But sure. uh, also, the, the trump card of race, sometimes okay. that can be used good, sometimes not. Thank you. Okay. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll take those in the order that you presented them. Um, the OJ trial is actually where the term, the race card, comes into the lexicon because in the wake of the trial, one of OJ's attorneys, uh, Robert Shapiro, infamously made the comment 
he had apparently c come to the conclusion that his client was guilty, although I think he started out thinking otherwise. And he then said in the aftermath of the verdict that Johnny Cochran, the other lead attorney, had played the race card and in, 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 in Shapiro's words, had dealt it from the bottom of the deck. Now, I've written about this pretty extensively and here's what I'll, what I'll say about the OJ case. I watched the trial almost in its entirety and I know a lot of other people who did, white, black, and otherwise. Um, do I think that OJ was likely guilty? The answer is yes. And frankly, most black folks you talk to also think so. But 70% of black folks still thought the verdict was just in spite of the fact that it, at their heart they thought he may very well be and probably was guilty because they felt as though the state had not proven its burden. Now, one can disagree with that, but let me explain where the race aspect of the case makes sense to a person of color, where it might not make sense to you or me or a lot of other white folks. For a person of color to, to learn that the lead detective in the case who discovers the blood evidence has a history of racism and brutality and mistreatment of people of color, which actually describes most of the LAPD, frankly, but especially Mark Furman sends off alarm bells, understandably, in the mind of any black person hearing it, because there's that alarm bell that says, ding, 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 this sounds familiar, you know. And whereas to most white folks, not all, but most white folks, to think that cops frame black people just because they're black seems absurd. But of course, it is the history of law enforcement in black communities. Most folks don't know that in the, up to about the 1940s, about half of all black people who were murdered in this country were murdered either directly by law enforcement officials or with the complicity of law enforcement officials. So people of color have this, this historical memory that is hard to dislodge. If Furman had not been demonstrated to be a racist in the case, that alarm bell would not have gone off and probably the difference in perception would have been quite different. But because of that, black folks said, you know what, you're gonna have to demonstrate to me that in spite of that racism, that that somehow didn't taint the case. For people of color to have that reaction made perfect sense. It didn't make them irrational, didn't make them crazy, and it didn't mean it was the race card when it was played because it's an important issue that has some relevance. Whether it means that he's not guilty or not is not the question. The question is, and the state really bears the responsibility for using him as a witness. They didn't have to use Furman as a witness, but they did, and they discounted how important race was. So um, for people of color to have one perception and for white folks to have another makes perfect sense. It doesn't make either side irrational, either side unfair. It makes perfect sense for white folks to perceive the case the way that most whites did, and it makes just as much sense for people of color to do the same. Um, so yes, I mean, and, and note, it didn't work. I mean, it worked in the sense that he got off, but then uh, he is found civilly liable by a, by a mostly white jury who, of course, is never accused of having fallen prey to racial bonding. The black jury, mostly black jury in the criminal trial, was accused of just doing it because they were black and they were bonding with a black defendant, ignoring that black people put other black people away in jail in this country every day on juries. And, of course, when the white jury finds him civilly liable, no one said they were just bonding with the white victims, which is just as rational, I guess, an argument, but it goes to show we have a double standard in the way we perceive it. In the long run, it hasn't worked. O.J. is not now rehabilitated in the public mind. If the race card had really worked on white people, white folks would have been, uh, you know, with the dominant majority, he would now be rehabilitated and be a commentator on Fox News or MSNBC. Mark Furman, on the other hand, is. Mark Furman gets interviewed all the time as an expert on police matters, even though he is a proven bigot, which says a lot. It says that at the end of the day, you can say, this man's a racist who uses racial slurs regularly and admits to brutality and wanting to kill people and being involved in acts of, of illegality. And it's okay, he can be a commentator, you know. So I think um, it's actually proof that the race card doesn't work very well in the long run. And in that case, I don't even think it was a card. It was relevant to the case, even if it did not mean that he was not guilty. It's only one piece of the case, but it was relevant. The, um, uh, the other example with regard to Michael Jackson, I think, you know, here, I think you make a, I think you make a stronger case um, that the, the attacks on Jackson, um, and I don't know the truth of Jackson, you know, his guilt or innocence either. Again, we never do. You know, we have suspicions about cases, but I haven't seen all the evidence. I've seen only what I have seen, and um, I can't even make a, draw a conclusion as to whether or not he's, he's guilty or not. I think there's some evidence of his guilt, just as there was with O.J., though, to be sure. But having said that, I agree that once, once Michael Jackson, who really had never sort of... And O.J. was like this, too, right? They never... I mean, O.J. Simpson actually famously said 
that he couldn't wait to get out of South Central LA and he didn't feel like he had any obligation to black people and he sort of turned his back on the black community. So the irony of him making race an issue, even though I think it was, was that he wasn't exactly somebody who'd ever cared, you know. And Michael Jackson sort of the same. Michael Jackson had never sort of been an advocate for the black community. So it was a little odd to hear him to hear him talking about it. But once again, it didn't work, which is to say that we, we need to recognize that even though there may be instances where somebody perceives race to be an issue and it's honestly not an issue or it's a minor issue, that doesn't discount the fact that when people of color in the broad social realm, larger society, talk about being victims, and they're not superstars like O.J. Simpson or Michael Jackson or whatever, that the odds of that being quite genuine or actually having a significant nugget of truth has to be looked at very, very seriously. In the case of Michael Jackson, there may have been an act of desperation, but once again, it didn't work, which, which to the extent that it didn't work and people don't buy it, means that it isn't a very powerful card. And I guess that's the point I'm trying to make, is it's not much of a card to play, and I think people of color know that, which is why it's very rare that they would just go to that place if they didn't honestly believe it. Now, just because you honestly believe it doesn't mean it's all always going to be right, but it means that to think that people would just make it up as if that was going to get them somewhere when it doesn't, and Michael Jackson was a good example of it, seems sort of unlikely. As for your point about people being persecuted on the basis of difference, there's no question about this. Um, there are a lot of levels at which people are persecuted, and, and I alluded to some other than race uh, in the talk, uh, talking about gender and class and sexual orientation, disability status, etc. Um, and certainly, being perceived as different or outside the, the mainstream, whatever that mainstream may be, is certainly another area. The only thing I would want to say, and, and, and I don't believe in ranking oppressions, like some type of oppression Olympics, you know, it's not healthy. But I would say there is a fundamental difference between the mistreatment that is institutionalized and has been historically institutionalized on the basis of those immutable characteristics like race and and, and gender's not completely immutable, obviously, but, but it is for, for most people. It's, it's not changeable or going to be changed. Um, sexual orientation, uh, or even, uh, and even class to an extent, because even though it's mutable, most people stay in the same class position they start out with. And comparing those to people who dress different or listen to different music. I, used to, I, you know, I came up on, on punk music, and that was sort of my, a lot of my politicization actually came out of punk music. And, um, um, and, and so I certainly know what it was to be looked at really weird for liking that music, for going to those shows, for going to those clubs, et cetera. Um, but I always knew that um, even though I shouldn't have to change the way I looked or the music I listened to or the way that I interacted, there was always the realization that I could. Now, I shouldn't have to, but there was the realization that I could, that if it came time to go get a regular job in order to survive, I could do it. I could, I could look a certain way. I could pretend to like a different kind of music if I had to. I shouldn't have to do any of that, but I couldn't pretend not to be black if I were black. I couldn't pretend not to be a woman if I were a woman. I couldn't pretend not to be, I mean, I guess I could stay in the closet if I was gay, but, um, you know, it's just that, that, that ability to just say you're not something is a lot harder when it's one of these characteristics around race, around gender. So absolutely being crapped on, uh, as, you, as you talked about in your own situation, because of difference is, is always wrong and it's always oppressive and it always ought to be stopped. And, 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 and don't get me wrong, it's not any less morally or ethically wrong. It's just that as an expert on race, I do think it's, it's important that we Sometimes that we spend just a little time really just sort of talking about race. And other times we ought to spend some time just talking about gender. And other times just talking about class and really getting clear on that. And we ought to talk about what it means to get crap for being different for whatever reason um, so that we can create a more equitable society. But, um, and so I always encourage people to have those conversations. But I think race is such an important one historically in this country. And it's one that I think those of us who are white sometimes have the luxury of ignoring. And as the end of my speech indicated, it's really sort of dangerous to ignore it. Uh, in the long run for all of us. So I'm sorry for the length of that answer, but it was a good lengthy question. I wanted to spend the amount of time on it that I thought it, it necessitated. Other questions? Yes, yeah. Oh, you can do it from there if you want, yeah. Um, my question is, um, where do we go from here? Right. And my second one would be, theoretically, do you think, how do we find that equality? I feel like if we bring people of color up, we're still playing the oppressive role. And if we lower ourselves, like, how does that work? <clears throat> well, it, 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 do the last one first. It's not about we are going to bring people of color up. To me, what, what I'm talking about is we've got to have policies, practices, and procedures in place 
that guarantee, or at least, I mean, they can't ever completely guarantee, but that as close to a guarantee as possible, limit the ability of people with privilege to bank that privilege to the detriment of others, and which provide to the greatest extent possible the full opportunity for marginalized group members to exercise autonomy and, and, and attain the levels of their ability, which are, in every natural sense of the word, every bit as much as the dominant group. So what, what, what does that mean in, in practical terms? Well, for example, um, there are a lot of things we could do as, as a society that wouldn't require lowering the dominant group per se, except insofar as we might consider it a lowering for me not to be able to take unfair advantage of the stuff I've already got. That, I mean, I guess that is. In a sense, I am saying we got to give something up. The thing we got to give up is the ability to take unearned advantage, unfair advantage of a pre-existing condition. So, for example, I really do think that colleges and universities and law schools and grad schools and medical schools should either completely eliminate the use of standardized testing in the consideration of admissions or significantly undermine the importance of them, making them optional, as about 600 schools have now done around the country, to no detriment uh, in terms of the quality of their entering student bodies. And the reason, and this is just one very small piece of a larger reform, the reason is that, I think we all sort of know intuitively, if not from having done the research, that those tests a, they're very lousy predictors of actual performance. I mean, even, even by, admitted by the people who make the test. They have no significant relationship to overall college grades, med school grades, law school grades. There are actually studies that find that the law school admissions test has an inverse relationship to future performance as a lawyer. Like, actually, the better you do on the test, the, the less satisfied you are professionally 10 years later. So they ought to let in the people with the lower scores, if anything, you know, because they do better. Um, but, so A, it's a lousy predictor of ability, but B, it also, privileges the dominant group, both in terms of race and class, because those are the folks who will have had the better access to quote unquote better education with better resources, more trained teachers, more honors classes, advanced placement classes, enrichment opportunities, et cetera. Um, and those who are from non-dominant groups, particularly in terms of race and class, won't have had that. So then we basically give people these profoundly unstandardized educations in this country, and then we all give them the same test. Right? So we take unstandardized kids and give them a standardized test and we call that fair. See, this is how we're going to leave no child behind. But really, we're going to leave a lot behind because no child left behind, if it were serious, we would insist on everybody getting the same education, then test them on the same stuff. I got no problem with that. You give everybody the exact same quality education, give them the same test, I'll call that fair. But if you give them all different educations and give them the same test, that's just crap. That, that's just setting people up to fail and then punishing them when they don't know the answers to stuff they were never told. You know, oh, well, you're an idiot, you know? You didn't get that right. No, we never taught it to you, but that's your fault. Um, so go clean the streets, you know, is basically the message that's being given. And at some point, if we were to restrict the, the use of those tests or to marginalize them or, you know, eliminate them altogether, it would mean that privileged people may still be getting better resources until we really equalize K through 12, but even if they did, that would reduce their ability to capitalize on that at the point of admission to college, right? Um, so that's just one little thing. And there, obviously there are examples we could talk about in the housing market and in, in the labor market as well and others in education. So it's not so much about we're gonna bring people up or we're gonna lower, we're just, we wanna put in place mechanisms that ensure to the greatest extent possible that people really will be judged on their effort and their abilities and not on the basis of something that is arbitrary like race or class or gender or sexual orientation, physical disability disability, et cetera. Um, the, the other part is sort of the, the where do we go from here piece. Um, here's what I'm going to say, and this is going to sound like a cop out, but it is not. It is a well thought out answer. Um, I can't tell you that. The reason I can't is twofold. One, I don't know for sure, and that's just being honest. People of color have been trying to figure out how to eliminate white supremacy for hundreds of years, and they haven't figured it out. The odds of this almost 38-year-old white boy having done so Pretty slim, pretty slim. Um, so A, I don't know the answers. I've got some ideas and some suggestions, but, but I think the real, the most important suggestion is that where we go is, is, is starting with, with recognizing that we cannot afford to give away our agency in that matter, that is to say, our own ability to come up with that answer to those who are deemed experts, whether it's me, whether it's a politician, whether it's a talking head on TV or a professor in a classroom. Answers are found in struggle. Answers are found in community. Answers are gonna be found by the people in this room to the problems in this community, and I'm gonna blow out of here in the morning. 
And I, you know, I'd love to come back sometime. But last time I was in Montana, it was like 97, man. So, you know, I mean, it, 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 if I give you an answer and it doesn't work, I won't even know that it didn't work. Y'all will be paying the price. And so the answers have to come from the people in the situation because you know your community best and you know what some of the issues are here best. Um, I always say, you know, let's study the past movement activity that we want to mirror and that we want to even improve upon. And if you go back and you look at the early early part of the modern civil rights movement, you look at the, at, at the early 1960s, for example, and you look at, at what Ella Baker did, who was a, 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 a woman who really isn't given nearly enough credit for the role she played in the formation of the modern civil rights, and particularly the student movement. But here was a woman who had been doing anti-racism and civil rights work really since the 30s and the 40s uh, in New York. She'd worked with the NAACP. She worked with King's Group, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. She left both of those groups because she didn't view them as democratic in their, in their structure. They were too male-dominated. They were too elite-dominated. They were too ministerial-dominated. And she, you know, thought it was an oppressive environment. And she also saw these young people, young college kids mostly, and even high school students, right, who were 18 to you know 25 in most cases, really 18 to 22 primarily, who she saw had a whole lot of energy, a whole lot of, of, of passion around this issue, didn't necessarily know how to end segregation, for goodness sake, but she saw in them a potential she didn't see in King and Abernathy and some of the older heads who were doing the work and getting a lot of the credit. So she said, look, we need to have you guys get together. And so she calls a meeting at Shaw University in, in, in North Carolina, gets a bunch of students together. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee is born. And she becomes a huge mentor and advisor to SNCC over the next few years. And basically what SNCC did was it took a bunch of young people, the age of most of you in this room, or even some younger than many of you in this room, and they got together in church basements and they met for eight hours. And when they came into the room, they had no idea what was going to come out. They had no idea what they were going to do next. They had no idea what their plan was going to be. But they came out with some of the most important and exciting and meaningful direct action and educational work that's ever been done in this country, and it helped break the back of formal apartheid. I say formal because informal is still unfortunately with us, but it made a significant difference, and it was because this older woman said, these young people who I don't have any reason to trust their knowledge, but by God, I trust that they can get something done, and I say the same to you. And I'm not anywhere in the same rank or class as Ella Baker in, in, in the regard of what I've accomplished in my life. But I'm telling you, I believe that if people get together, young, middle-aged, and older folks, and get together and really talk about what the problem is, I think that we have enough collective wisdom to come up with some answers. I would only give you the advice that let's apply those answers starting right where we live. Let's start locally and build outward from there, really starting where we are and figuring out uh, here at this college. I was, we were talking earlier at the, at the reception, at the dinner little thing we had with some of us. I said, you know, the best thing to do, I think, is to start with your college and, and uh, with this community and say for those, for example, at this school, what is the school doing that keeps in line with its mission? I'm sure if I go on your website right now, I can look at the mission statement of this university, and it's going to be some really pretty paragraph or two. Lovely statement about diversity and, 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 and lifelong learning and community involvement, and because commu that's what all of them say. They all say that. They're all these beautiful comments that basically are about social justice and equity. And yet not a single college ever operationalizes that mission. And what I mean by that is not a single college says, you know what, in order to be a member of this institution, you got to buy into this, and you got to demonstrate a commitment to it, and if you don't, you ain't coming. You're not getting hired, you're not getting tenure, you're not graduating, you're not getting admitted until you demonstrate that this mission actually means something to you. And if you don't like that, you can go to a different school. And schools get nervous when I say that because they're like, well, now wait, we can't have a litmus test. Well, you got a mission statement that says this is why you exist. You wouldn't join a church that you didn't agree with. You wouldn't join a synagogue or a mosque, and they wouldn't want you if you fundamentally disagreed with the principles upon which they were founded. So if the school says, here's what we're about, here's why we're here, I don't see anything wrong with saying, hey, you want to come here? Cool. What does this mission statement mean to you, and how do you intend to live it? In your work as a student, in your work as a faculty member, in your work as a staff. And, then once, and you can lie if you want to and make it sound like, you know, I guess you could come in for an interview and say, nothing matters more to me than diversity and equity. It is what I have lived and breathed my entire life. Okay, fine, you can lie and get in, but then if you want to get promoted, you better do something to demonstrate that as a professional service project. As a student, you better do something to demonstrate it in order to graduate. So it seems to me like if schools would just put up or shut up and say, here's what we're about, and if they don't like that litmus test, then just change the 
the wording of the mission statement. You don't have to have that mission statement, but it seems to me that's a great place to start is to say, here's what the institution says we're about. What are we doing that actually operationalizes that in practice? If the answer is nothing, that's a problem. And then the campaign can be built around and the movement can be built around simply saying, here's what you swear to us you are about. Let's figure out ways to make that real. And there are a lot of creative ideas you might be able to come up with about how to make it real. Everything from admissions and recruitment to, to financial aid, to curriculum, to tenure review, to, I mean, you, know, you can think of a lot of stuff. But those are just a few, a few possible suggestions. There are obviously many more that you can come up with. A couple more questions real quick. Yes. The media, he, he said for those in the back that he feels the media perpetuates a lot of segregation. By segregation, do you mean that formally in terms of racial separation or do you mean racism itself as a... I guess perpetuates Okay, perpetuates stereotypes. I think you're absolutely right. Um, and in fact, you know, um, a, another good example of this, there was a, a study that came out, I don't know, maybe two months ago, I wrote an article about it, about that found that, you know, um, black students are actually the least likely to, you know, uh, I'm talking about uh, 12 to, to 18 year olds, I guess, less likely to use illegal narcotics, less likely to drink to excess, less likely to do all kinds of things that are, that are potentially self-destructive or even destructive to others. And that didn't make the news at all, except in these little bitty snippets, you know, like um, it's good news about, about students of color, but you wouldn't have heard that in any news. On the other hand, if there was a report that found that gang violence among you know, black and brown youth was out of control, that would have been all over the news. We'd have specials about it. We've done that before, in fact, back in the mid-90s. In fact, it was interesting, the very week that OJ was found not guilty, um, US News had a, I think it was, no, it was Newsweek, one of them. They had a, it was actually US News, they had an article, a uh, whole thing, you know, everybody had OJ on the cover and everything. And then if you thumb through it, not only was there a big story about OJ and, and, and there was another story about Farrakhan and the Million Man March, but then there was a story in the back that was about black crime. And the title was like, A Shocking Look at Blacks and Crime. And if you actually read the article, you'd find out that the article was actually talking about, yes, the crime rate's higher in urban black communities, but it was also talking about the disparities in enforcement. So if you read it, you got a much more nuanced picture. But the title, a shocking look at blacks and crime, needless to say, when all those white kids went off and shot up their schools, or when white middle class men lose money in the stock market and go kill their whole family and wipe out the business park, you know, which seems to happen every couple of years, nobody says a shocking look at whites in crime or 85% of the serial killers are white men. Nobody says, you know, what is it about white men that makes them chop bodies up and bury them under the house and cook the heads in a soup pot and you know, keep body parts in the fridge or whatever. And obviously I'm being sarcastic. There's nothing about whiteness that makes us do that, but it sure as hell is us, you know, uh, every, every time, like, I mean, if there's a story where somebody's like killed their parents and drained their blood and drank all their blood and then had a sacrifice on an altar to the devil, you, I mean, black folks will tell you, I know that was a white person. Not because white people are cannibalistic Satan worshipers, but just because certain types of crimes, to, you know, and we don't, you know, and I'm, again, I'm being, trying to be sarcastic. I, I go to Spokane a lot and Spokane, lovely place, but man, they got serial killers running around all the time. Every time I'm up there, there's one on the loose, a coincidence, I assure you. <laughs> and yet at no point have I been stopped on the streets of Spokane by cops who, because I fit the profile, white and male, and the right age group. They never like, where were you on Wednesday night? They just don't, they don't roll up on me that way. And so I, even though I fit the, and there is a profile of a serial killer that's a white man, that is the official profile. But the profile doesn't get acted on the same way, right? Um, and so to me, the media does a lot of that by, by de-racializing white crime Right? In fact, corporate crime, we don't even call it white, it's white collar. But the collar is not the only thing lacking color. Most of the time, the skin also lacks a little bit. And so we, it's corporate crime, but who the hell's doing it, man? But like when Martha Stewart did her thing, my wife was not rolling around going, God, I, I hope they don't think that I'm scamming stocks, you know? It, it wasn't gonna stick to her. So the media de-racializes white pathology, racializes black and brown pathology. Katrina was a great example of it. It was horrible. The media got all this praise for their supposedly aggressive coverage. Aggressive because why? Because Geraldo got pissed in front of national television. He does that as a matter of course. 
horse, you know, uh, because Sh Shepard Smith at Fox yelled at Bill O'Reilly, ooh, good TV, you know. And But what was really happening was that the media, who's getting all this praise for their coverage, they're the same media that were showing the same clip of the same five looters over and over and over and over again. Y'all thought it was different looters, but it wasn't. It was just different angles. I know the block. Okay, because I live there. I know exactly the store where it was just ABC was over here, NBC was over here, CBS was right there, Fox was over there, MSNBC's right there. It's the same woman coming out with Huggies. And you saw it from five different angles, and oh, they're crazy, they're out of control. Or they showed the guy with the big screen TV, the same guy, the one guy. They showed that, I counted 37 times in a 30 minute period, uh, MSNBC showed this clip. And everybody got pissed. Oh my God, look, they're thugs. They're, they're, they're not even taking necessary items. Bill O'Reilly actually, in his infinite wisdom, said, um, said uh, I think the gang members just stuck around and didn't evacuate on purpose so then they could loot. <laughs> Man, gang members don't need an excuse to take stuff. They don't have to wait around for a damn flood to take, if they want to take the shoes, they're going to just take the shoes, man. They just like, he actually thinks they were sitting around going, well, <laughs> my fellow Crips, uh, you know, we're going to wait until everybody leaves and then we're going to just walk in and take this. And they just blast their way in if that's what they want to do. But he said that, he said, oh, the big screen TVs, they're terrible. Ah, but here's the thing, the media, if the media wasn't perpetuating stereotypes and really wanted to get to the bottom of it, they could have gone and asked, why are you taking the TV? That's what I wanted to know because I was thinking about it thinking, now this guy, has to know he can't plug that in right what's he gonna do i'm gonna go back to my flooded ass house and plug in the t like he has to know that's not gonna work there are no lights so i'm thinking okay on the assumption that he's not just an idiot he must know something that i don't well it turns out he did because i talked to people who were down there i had friends who were actually trapped on uh canal and, and on poydras at, at the convention center and at the superdome and they said look yeah people were taking some stuff like like big screen tv stereos but you know what they were doing with that they were bartering that to get out of town they were getting rides from people that had cars that were functioning like they're not coming to help us my family needs to get out i'll give you this tv if you give me a ride now, that doesn't necessarily make it right Right? But it puts a different spin on it for sure because it clearly indicates that these aren't just irrational, crazy people. But did the media report that? No. The media reported only on the crime itself. And then they reported there's mass violence in the Superdome. There are mass rapes going on, gang rapes. And oh my God, the convention center, when the lights go down, babies are getting molested, having their throats slit. This was being reported on national news, on, on broadcast and in print. They, they, I heard that there were five babies who were tossed in a dumpster and they were molested and killed. And it's a, it's a, it's a free fire zone in here. And, and everybody, believe, everybody believed this. Everybody seemed to believe it. Turns out three weeks later, LA Times comes out with a report, New Orleans Times, Picayune, AP. Oh, sorry, it didn't happen. But the retraction is on page 17 of most papers, and so most people didn't see it. And so everybody, you know, it's like there were no bodies, there was no evidence. Everybody that said they saw it finally said, well, no, I actually didn't see the baby get its throat slit, but I heard that it happened. And it just got reported. I'm telling you, if God forbid a hurricane were to hit Nantucket, Cape Cod, some wealthy white place, and they said, uh, there's a bunch of uh, white Episcopalians down the block who are raping people in the church. They're out of control, and there's bodies stacked up to the ceiling. So the media is going to say, I need to see some bodies. I need to see some evidence before I roll with that story. But you can say anything you want about black people in this country, and they'll report it. And the sad thing is it wasn't just white people that bought into it. Ray Nagin, black mayor, bought into it. Goes on Oprah, repeats the story. Eddie Compass, black police chief, believes the story. Goes on Oprah, repeats it. Oprah herself believes it. She repeats it. Tiger Woods repeats it. I don't know why they even asked him. But the media, the media went to Tiger who doesn't even think he is black and said, what do you think about this? And Tiger says, I think it's terrible what my people, see now they're his people, what my people are doing in the streets of New Orleans. I don't know why they ask him. But then, and he was wrong, but he was misled too because these stories got out there and the media did it. And the sad fact is those media stories about mass violence contributed to the suffering because you had relief workers who said the reason they didn't go in in part, was because they were afraid that they were going to get shot at because they kept saying, oh, they're shooting at relief workers. They're shooting at the helicopters. Wrong again. But this is what everybody heard and what most people believe. What actually happened was you had people who were trying to get the attention of helicopters that kept flying by them and passing them over, right? They didn't have flares to send up. 
I'm sure if they had, they would have set off a flare or one of those glow sticks you get in the club. But they didn't have those, you know. They didn't have glow sticks. They didn't have flares. They had guns, and they were shooting them up in the, not at the helicopter, for God's sake. What kind of crazy ass shoots at the helicopter that's going to save them? They're just trying to get their attention. Not the best way to do it, but the only loud thing they had. They didn't have snapping pops or whatever. I mean, you know, uh, they even make snapping pops. I don't know. I'm, I've been on the road three days. I'm just on a roll, you know, but, but really, I mean, it's just this, the media didn't want to delve into that story. And so you're absolutely right that, and, and it's not necessarily because of deliberate bias, although I think there is some of that. A lot of times it's laziness on the part of the media. It's easier, if you ask the media why they continually overrepresent people of color as criminals relative to the actual share of crime done by people of color, the answer they'll give you, and, and they're probably telling the truth when they give this answer, the answer they'll give you is, um, well, you know, our, 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 our station is in the city, right? It's in the urban area, and so it's easier to go cover a crime that was right down the block in a public housing project than it is to go out to the suburbs where we know kids are doing the same stuff and where we know adults are doing the same stuff and where we know these things are happening but where it's harder to get the story, you know, because there's a, little, there's a lot more secrecy, there's a lot more insulation from, from, from what's going on. So, but it's lazy either way and, and it perpetuates the effect of it, regardless of the intent, is that it perpetuates these biases. I think one of the best things we could probably do to try to undo some of that, going back to this question of what to do next, this is one piece of advice I'll give, is I think we really need to start teaching media literacy to young people very early on um, and encouraging media literacy. The good news is that young people actually are much more media literate than older folks are because you know, young people, and by young people, I mean really anyone who's, who's college or younger has been bombarded and is being bombarded by so many types of media impulses that we didn't even have 10 years ago, let alone 15 or 20, that you gotta learn to filter. You know, and, and young, young, I mean, I got a five-year-old who can filter better than I probably can. So it seems to me like young people are very ripe to actually encourage them to say, okay, the music you're listening to, the TV you're watching, the movies you see, the video games you play, what's, what's in that picture and what's not? What's wrong with that picture and what's, you know, because, and, and what's interesting is when you encourage young people to do that, because they're already looking at it, it's a lot better than saying, don't watch that video, don't watch that movie, don't watch that TV, don't play that video game, because that just comes down as authoritarian sort of, you know, do what I want you to do, instead of saying, you're gonna do this anyway. What I want you to do is do it with a critical eye. I want you to think about what you're seeing. And when young people are encouraged to do that, in my experience, they are amazing at coming up with all kinds of things that we don't give them nearly enough credit as young people for, going back to the various ways that people are marginalized in this country. Age is another way in which that happens. They can come up with a million reasons why the ad was sexist or why the, why the video game was racist or why the video was, 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 was sexist or classist or whatever. And, and encouraging that kind of literacy and encouraging folks to say, well, what's wrong with this and what's wrong with this would be a really good way, I think, to get folks thinking about what you just said when you asked that question and when you made that comment, which was that the media plays such an important role. And if we were more critical in our assessment of it and encourage that, then we would be able to raise an entire generation of people who would make their own media and that media would be far different and would be prepared to challenge dominant media when they were doing those things. Um, but we just don't encourage that, you know. We, we unfortunately don't spend nearly enough time on it, maybe because we don't trust young people and their wisdom, but I think we should, and we should encourage them to develop it. A couple more real quick. Yes? So I was wondering if you could touch upon the distinction between charity and solidarity. Yeah, um, I'm finishing up a book on Katrina right now, uh, going back to my problem with procrastination. It was supposed to have been done six months ago. Um, and the last chapter, or actually, it's just a collection of essays. The last essay is about this distinction between charity and justice or solidarity or both. And the distinction I want to make there and that I make in that, in that essay and that I'll make here is that, you know, in the wake of Katrina, there have been roughly $3 billion in private charity raised. Not, not quite. Between two and a half and three billion. It's the largest single private charitable uh, relief effort in the history of the world, bigger than the tsunami, bigger than post 9-11 for private money, um, which is all fine, although most of that money went to just three organizations, the Red Cross, Salvation Army, and the, the Clinton Bush you know, Relief Fund. Um, so there are a lot of grassroots groups that really didn't benefit from that who actually are a lot more accountable to the people on the ground, which is unfortunate. But having said that, hey, it's great to be able to raise that kind of money. The difference, however, is 
that, and Dr. King talked about this, and, 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 and anti-racist folks have been talking about this for a long time. There's a huge difference between charity and justice because of a couple things. First of all, here's how we know there's a difference. Um, if you were to ask most people, I'll even say more than that. If you were to have gone to the American people prior to Katrina and said, I have just come from the future, and you could document this to where they didn't think you were crazy, and you said, I've just come from the future, here's what's going to happen to New Orleans. Here's what's going to happen if we don't do the following things. Restore the levees to this particular strength, uh, rebuild the wetlands so the storm surge will be knocked down, you know, uh, five feet for every mile of wetlands or whatever it is. Um, if we do those things, we can stop this destruction. But here's the deal, it's going to cost you 500 extra dollars in taxes over the next year or two. I have very little doubt that the vast majority of people, given that scenario, would say, okay, raise my taxes. In fact, I'm pretty damn sure that most people would say, I already pay too much in taxes, by God. I don't want my taxes going up anymore. But these are the same people that will write a check for $500 or more after a disaster happens to put Band-Aids on people once they're bleeding, right? Because, and so what is that about? It can't be about justice. It can't be about, about stopping suffering because you, you, you wouldn't have wanted to, st it's not about, you don't want to spend the money to stop it on the front end, but boy, let somebody get hurt and we're real good about rushing in and let us help you, let us help you. Why? Because it makes us feel good. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't give to charity. I'm not saying we ought not give to relief organizations, but it is sad that if you ask most, and you may think I'm being cynical, listen, you go to most people in this country and say, would you take charity? What do most people say? No, I'm too proud. But now, what does it say? If most people would be too proud to take it, what does it say when we're willing to give it about the way that we view the people who aren't apparently too proud to take it? It says, in effect, we are morally superior to you because we would never take this but here, you poor benighted soul. Right? So at some level, it's about the giver, not the givee. It's about making me get the warm fuzzy because if I write that check to the United States Treasury and let the government do it, Right, and spend the money on the program. I realize the government wastes some of that money, but you don't think the Red Cross does? The head of the Red Cross makes $475,000 a year to do what? You know, and they got new air conditioners and new offices with all this money. What, what, what did they do? They're not doing the work on the ground in, 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 the, in the Gulf Coast. In fact, you do know that the Department of Homeland Security wouldn't even let them come in during the flooding. Here's the, you know, this is a sick little fact for those who think that Katrina was all about incompetence and mismanagement and bungling. No, the Department of Homeland Security told the Red Cross, you're not allowed to go into New Orleans while people are sitting down there starving and dying. You're not allowed to go in. And the Red Cross actually had this on their website for like a week that said, we're really sorry we can't go. Everybody's asking us, but the reason is they won't let us. And the reason they won't let us is because, and this was a direct statement from the DHHS, the, I mean, DHS and Mike Chertoff, was that if we relieve the suffering, it would slow the evacuation process, and they wanted to get people out of town. So the priority wasn't justice, it wasn't solidarity, it was getting them out, and then we'll build some houses after the fact, you know, nice though that may be. Um, there's just a huge difference between doing it in order to help, which usually comes with a price attached, moral or, or, or political, but it's really about making you feel better, and you don't get the warm fuzzy when you write that check to the government, you know. You can't put in the memo line, this is for houses in the Gulf Coast, you know. It's just, this is for taxes, and this sucks, you know? But if I write it to Habitat for Humanity, see, I, I feel good. And we ought to write checks to Habitat. We ought to write checks to the People's Hurricane Relief Fund, which is a grassroots group in the Gulf that doesn't get nearly enough credit for the work they do. But, uh, but I think we got a long way to go, because it seems like we're far better at raising money to, to fix problems um, whether it's public money or private money, then we are to prevent problems. And, and if you don't believe me, just look what they're doing now. They're rebuilding the levees with government money to withstand a Category 2 storm, which is exactly what it was basically capable of doing last time. So if it's a high Cat 2 or a Cat 3, the same thing is going to happen. And if we really were about justice, we wouldn't allow it to happen. We'd find the money, because we find money for every damn thing in the world. We'll fight two wars at once, and we'll keep finding the money. And we will put a rover on Mars or whatever the hell we did, or we'll put people on the moon or whatever we do. You know, we shoot the things in the air and send Lance Bass into space. Or I guess that's the Russians, but whatever. But I mean, you know, we, we got money for everything we want to have money for, but we're not going to rebuild the levees even to withstand a Cat 3, which means, bottom line, we do not care if it happens again. And when I say we, I mean the policymakers. I don't necessarily mean we in this room or a lot of just average everyday people, but we're letting it happen. We're letting it happen 
So at some level, we're implicated, and, and charity is just not going to cut it. You know, it's not going to it's not going to solve that problem. One more question, if there is one. Yes. Yep. My question is, uh, from your perspective, being uh, someone who's worked with and dealt with issues of sexism, racism, and uh, gender bias, mm -hmm. uh, sexual preference, what needs to be done internally, from your perspective, in those groups, uh, and you can try to address it as an umbrella or as a mm -hmm. to better our relationship with, dealing with, the dominant culture to uh, affect violence? Well, I'm always um, reluctant to give advice to marginalized group members in terms of what they need to do vis-a-vis -vis the dominant group because, A, I'm not the one at risk if the advice is bad. It's like what I said before, and this is especially true. If I tell people of color what to do in their relationships with white folks or if I tell women what to do in order to strengthen their position vis-a-vis -vis men or if I tell LGBT folks what to do vis-a-vis -vis straight folks, you know, God forbid the advice is wrong because it isn't gonna, I'm not gonna be the one to pay the price for that. Not to mention, I think it'd be awfully opportunistic of me to say, well, here's what you people need to do, as if somehow I don't trust the wisdom of those folks getting together and knocking heads and figuring things out to actually prevail. I fundamentally believe that people of color will be the ones who will lead the, the, the elimination of white supremacy and any movement to do that, let alone that actually accomplishes it. And I think women will do the same with patriarchy, and I think that LGBT folks will do the same with straight supremacy. Um, I, 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 so I tend to focus more, obviously, by necessity, but also practically um, on what the dominant group members need to do to get either to get the hell out of the way and let those people lead who are in the, in the position to really know what needs to be done or to be allies, preferably both, but to get out of the way, but also to be an ally. You can do both things. Sometimes it sounds contradictory, but I actually think that when I say get out of the way, I mean don't feel the need to become the leader. A lot of times what happens is dominant group members get involved in the struggle. So white folks get involved in the anti-racism work, men in the anti-sexism work, um, straight folks in the, in the, in the, uh, in the LGBT liberation work, and, and real quickly sort of try to assume dominant leadership positions because we sort of have that either that missionary zeal that we're going to help you, we're going to save you mentality, or we've just been encouraged to think that we know best. I mean, you know, straight white men, especially if they come from upper middle class families, have been led to believe that they know best. So our wisdom should prevail, you know. And even good people with really good attitudes and good politics, quote unquote, and all that, still make that same mistake. So getting out of the way means realizing that the leadership for any movement for liberation really needs to be the people who have the most to lose. I, I hope white folks will be allies, but I don't trust white folks, including myself, to lead that work. There's too much, we have too much stake in the game, so to speak. We have too much to, to too many ways to be co-opted. I hope men will join the fight against sexism, but I'm not gonna put men in charge of that fight. Wouldn't wanna put them in charge if it were my job. Um, I hope people with money will realize the injustice of the class system, but I'm sure as hell not gonna put a millionaire in charge of eliminating the class system. Now, I hope that the millionaire gives me some money to help eliminate the class system, fund the revolution, whatever it is we're talking about. But I'm not gonna put them in charge, you know, take their money and some of their advice, but not gonna lead the day, you know, um, because they have too much stake in the game. So the only advice I ever offer to people of color is, uh, is don't look to us for advice and, and, and trust the wisdom, collected wisdom of the communities of oppressed and marginalized peoples to be the wisdom that's needed. And, and to know that people in marginalized and oppressed positions can be the agents of their own liberation. Study that history, know how that has happened and when that has happened and how progress has been made. Because every time progress has been made on this front, it's been because of the concerted efforts of the marginalized. Yes, there have been allies along the way, but the marginalized didn't wait for the, for the, for the dominant group to come along before they got involved in doing the work. And if the dominant group came along, great. If they didn't, great. They didn't necessarily tailor their message to fit. You know, the only other advice I would give is just be straight about what you're demanding up front. The only thing I think we have learned from the previous movements is that you don't want to compromise your goals on the front end. Sometimes strategically, you have to compromise on the back end. We understand that. To get a, to get a half a loaf sometimes, uh, you, you, you know, to, you, to get a quarter, to get a half a loaf, you gotta you know, sometimes ask for more than half a loaf and then work backwards, that's fine. 
Strategically, sometimes that makes sense on the road toward ultimate liberation. The problem is sometimes we compromise part of the loaf before the battle even starts by thinking, well, if we lower our sights and make it a more moderate demand, we'll be more likely to get support. May be true. But then when you get that demand and then you go on to the next one, folks look at you like, well, wait a minute now. We gave you what you wanted. Now you're coming up with new stuff, right? So the only mistake maybe that the civil rights movement made um, in that regard was that they, they framed the demands in a way that maybe, maybe at the time you could say it made sense, but the problem is in retrospect, yet a lot of white folks afterward that said, well, we desegregated the damn lunch counters and you got the voting rights protected. You know, we did all these things, what more do you want? Because the, the framing was not, we want to eliminate racism, including economic apartheid, right? The framing was, we want to eliminate segregation and Jim Crow. And that was part of racism and apartheid, but it wasn't the whole loaf. So unfortunately, by making that compromise front end, maybe it got that accomplished quicker, but then it made it harder to move on to the next level. So I think nowadays we got to just be straight with people, say this is what our goal is, whatever it is. And yeah, it might mean that at the beginning fewer people are on board, but at least the ones who are on board really know what the game is. And no one can accuse you of being disingenuous later by adding demands. No, no, we were always clear. This is what we were about. Now, yeah, we were willing to take this little compromise for now, and we're willing to take this little piece of progress for now, because it's always about incremental progress that you get on the road to liberation. But, but it's easier if you say, yeah, that's, that's the first step. OK, that's the second step. But everybody understands there's 10 steps. Instead of acting like, hey, you got what you wanted. Why are you still complaining? Which is sort of where we're at now, sadly. But other than that, I don't, I don't believe in giving too much advice to folks of color, because they're usually the ones who know a lot better than I do. You know, um, and the only other advice I would give to us, who were, those of us who are white or in any dominant group, is to learn to listen to those who were in marginalized group positions and to believe what they say. And if we would just do that, it'd make it so much easier for marginalized group members and dominated and oppressed group members to do what they need to do. You know, it makes it a lot easier for for those folks to do what they need to do when when white folks or men or straight folks or folks with money or whatever the dynamic is, you know, are willing to listen and follow. It's, it, what makes it hard is when the dominant group isn't willing to listen or follow, then it's like you're beating your head against a wall. And then it becomes hard and frustrating and easier to just sort of say to hell with it. I, I don't even want to talk or think about it anymore. So that's the, maybe the, the biggest way that we can work in solidarity is to start by, by believing what people of color say, believing what women say, believing what LGBT folks say, believing what people with disabilities say, believing what working class folks say. Thank you all for coming out. That's about all the time that we have. Thanks.